Welcome back to Talk of the Town. I'm your host, Steve Knox, and joining me on the phone right now is director, producer, Danbury native, Mr. Chris Samoes, who is going to tell us all about his new film and his career in uh, filmmaking, uh, Bigfoot the Conspiracy. Mr. Samoes, welcome to Talk of the Town. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I appreciate you joining me here today. Uh, so, yes, fascinating. You, you, uh, you have... This is not your first movie, but uh, you're, you've got your movie now on Amazon Prime. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you, sir. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, we're excited. How's that feel, man? That's got to be pretty cool. Yeah, it is. It gets, you know, kind of global distribution. We just got it released in Japan as well on Prime. Wow. So that's cool. <laughs> yeah. How do you make that happen? How do you make something like that happen? Well, you got to, you know, submit it. You got to, you know, to the Amazon Prime for their review and, attach closed captioning and obviously for japan we have to get japanese subtitles and uh, submit that with the artwork and trailer and and all that and then they review it for quality control and you get you know we got approved so here we are you know rolling <laughs> how did i mean when it sounds like a pro kind of a com complicated process uh how did you navigate that i mean did you know what you were getting yourself into or was this something that uh, just sort of you, you just sort of bounced along doing what you had to do well actually um with another project um a, flip, a good friend of mine that actually helped me produce this dave Watkins. he he's the one that introduced me to the idea because he had you know kind of done that with a couple of his films so you know he, he turned me on to it and kind of guided me through it the first time you know i went through the process which like you said was a little overwhelming and um, I was thinking, ah, you know, this isn't going to happen, you know. <laughs> but um, but I stuck with it, and uh, and we ended up, you know, getting it getting it accepted. Yeah, never say never, man. You know, this some yeah. stuff. It's it's amazing as you go through life, the changes that get thrown your way, and some are good and some are bad. And this one sounds like it might actually be a very positive step in your career as a movie maker. Yeah, for sure. You know, here I am. You know, we're basically no budget on on our films. Um, we we do everything ourselves. We got a skeleton crew. Um, you know, basically, me, Dave, and my daughter Alexa, who was director of photography on this film, which was a huge help for me because I'm in this movie and I'm not typically in it. But uh, Dave actually took, you know, convinced me to play the the part of the lead because it was just so hard to pin actors down and get people there, you know, for screen credit when you're, you know, small time indie producer. So he and I played some pretty major roles in the movie and uh, got my daughter who's a talented photographer to play uh, to be uh, director of photography and run camera for us most of the time and got her in the film as well as long, along with my other kids and, and some friends and family and we have some professional actors in there as well so it's a good mix and now you're going to go all hollywood on us aren't you yeah <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no no i'm still a retired uh law enforcement officer and mentality i will, will be you know <laughs> yeah i think you have, you have an interesting background here uh you you have not been in filmmaking your entire life right no not at all uh, no not at all i uh i was in federal law enforcement i was a border patrol agent and then a federal air marshal and uh started to develop back problems and leg issues and you know sciatica a lot of you know leg pain and numbness and Eventually, I was forced to retire early, which, you know, was a difficult proposition for me, you know, and uh, kind of went into the private sector, worked, worked in a few different jobs, and, uh, you know, was kind of just bored, you know, and I just one day just decided to heck with it. I'm going to do something I can be passionate about, and filmmaking is always, you know, something that I was really interested in, and I just kind of always put it on the back burner and never had money to buy equipment or anything else or time so I, I started an ebay page and sold a couple bicycles and tools and anything <laughs> else i could find in the basement and started buying production equipment and teaching myself and learning from friends and youtube tutorials and um just started going from there you know you're a modern day ed wood uh yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah now, is, so, this movie's yeah. called bigfoot the conspiracy uh, is this is this a sequel to the previous Bigfoot movie, The Curse of Blood Mountain? Yes and no. It, it's really not. Um, if you saw the first one, you'll understand a couple references, and there's one character in there, um, Eddie Riggs, played by Chris Burns, that 
he was one of the main characters in the first one, and he's like a Bigfoot witness that gets interviewed by a federal agent in this movie. But you, you wouldn't, you don't, you know, it's a self-contained sequel, I guess, in that you don't have to, you know, it doesn't matter if you saw the first one or not to understand the movie. But you understand the reference, obviously, if you saw the first one, which was my first endeavor back in uh, 2014. So tell us a little bit about the movie. What's the what's the uh, the, the kind of the plot of the fil the film here? Well, strangely enough, it's about a retired border patrol agent that I guess accidentally discovers evidence of of, of you know possibly possible existence of Bigfoot, and then now he starts investigating that, and you know goes out into the woods and using his border patrol tracking skills, starts tracking him and and that kind of thing, and then. A lot of other stuff kind of unfolds, you know. Ba you know, and the whole the whole concept of the movie, the conspiracy, is based on, like, I made the first movie and then got to know a lot of people that are Bigfoot enthusiasts and uh, you know, firm Bigfoot believers, and they have all these conspiracy theories about how the government covers up the existence. That's why, you know, there's no real proof. They, you know, and um, if there's a Bigfoot sighting, the government will post signs and not let anybody in there. There's all these theories that people have and just based on what all these people told me i was like no, i'm gonna write i need to write a script about all that so that's where it came from yeah no that sounds like a pretty a really cool idea because uh again it's not just a uh, you know a, a movie about bigfoot it's a movie about you know government conspiracies and and what do we believe and what can we believe and uh you know look i'm a big fan of of, of being skeptical of anything i'm told by the government uh, and Absolutely. certainly there's things yeah. out there that we are not told and that we don't know um, that, uh, you know, maybe for our best, our, I, I, wouldn't un I wouldn't understand why they would block evidence of Bigfoot. I mean, it's not, you know, so it's another kind of creature out in the woods. What, why are we afraid of kind of talking yeah. about that? I know, I know, who knows, yeah. who knows. But, I mean, you're right, though. Just, you know, working in federal law enforcement and the federal government, and I would be involved directly or have intimate knowledge about certain things or incidents that would be in the news and it was always reported completely inaccurately hmm. in the news and so i'm like i would have to tell people that's not what happened you know that's not at all what happened especially with the border patrol they get a lot of negative press and uh, you know so they would say things i think just to always make the border patrol look like villains and it's just it's not the case at all everything's twisted on them you know and i feel bad as a lot of great people down there risking their life every day you know. Oh yeah, my daughter uh, dated a, a, a kid whose father was a border patrol agent down in Arizona, and uh, he, he and I would talk all the time. And he would the stuff that he would just tell me, and, and it would, like you say, totally fly in the face of what is being reported in the news. And I think that's just it's such a shame because it, again, as you say, you know what's going on, and then you hear the stories, and it's got to just drive you nuts. <laughs> you know, when you sit there, and you uh, go, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> yeah, it's maddening. It's maddening. I produced a video last year with evidence of, of children being trafficked with the caravans that were coming across those family groups that was kept being posted in the media, you know, with the kids in cages and all that. Mm -hmm. And the smugglers were actually using the kids to form fake family groups. And then once, the, once they got released, they would send the kids back and they would cross again with other people. They would just make these fake families so they could get released, you know, versus being detained and sent back. So they would get released into the country. So it was just a big scam, you know, all, almost all of it, you know. And, the, and smugglers were making a fortune, you know, oh. of these poor people. And these poor kids would die occasionally, and then they blame the Border Patrol. Meanwhile, most of these kids are receiving their first ever medical care in their life when they get into Border Patrol custody. They're treated like gold. You know, they're kept warm, they're fed, they have medical care, they get everything. And then you see stuff like, you know, with AOC saying, oh, it's a concentration camp. It's absurd. That's absurd, you know. And, it, and it's, it's hurtful because it enrages people, but it's not true. They, don't, they would never treat people that way. We, we never treated people that way, you know. That's, and, that's uh, and I know we're kind of gone, I got off on a tangent here, but yeah, that's, that's one sure. of the tragedies, sure. I think, of that whole story is, you know, believing that of your fellow man, especially someone like yourself who's taken – the you know volunteered to put on the badge and, and take what could be a very dangerous job to accuse you of some of these you know just vile behaviors 
uh, always just frustrated me to death. And the fact that the, the media just totally misrepresented that and just went along with whatever narrative was trying to, that they were trying to create, I thought was just complete and utter uh, uh, disrespect for the work that you people do. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's really a shame, you know, and it just pits the people against us, like, and, you know, I would try to talk to people down there. And it's, it's sad because even along those border towns, the people, the majority of the people hate the Border Patrol, you know, because of everything they hear. Um, but the people we would encounter 99% of the time out in the, in the desert or wherever, where people that were illegal crossing the border, it was very amicable. They were very respectful, and, and we would help them, feed them, give them water, bring them into the station and process them. But it was, you know, it was the smugglers that, you know, were dangerous and armed and, and that kind of thing. And we often would rescue people would come running to us running from border bandits and smugglers mm. bleeding with all their money gone and then you know there'd be a sometimes exchange gunfire and then the news says border patrol shoot that migrant workers you know and it's like <laughs> we were saving the migrant workers why did they write that like that was an eye-opener to me i was very naive you know i was i just couldn't get like why would they say that happened who yeah. told them that nobody told them that that's just their spin and it was so frustrating and sad because that's just not the case, you know, and, and you see what's happening now in the country. Everyone, we're really, I don't think we're really that far apart on our morals and what we believe. It's just we believe some people choose to believe this news and other people choose to, you know, believe that. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a shame. Yeah, it's, it's, it's frustrating, and I deal with it on a almost daily basis. Uh, yeah. But let's get back to movie making here. Let's get back yeah, to the more sorry, serious yeah. topic of movie <laughs> making. <laughs> For sure, yeah. yeah. So as you, as you mentioned, this is not your first film. Your first film was, uh, the first feature length film was, was Bigfoot, The Curse of Blood Mountain. Uh, yeah, sure. Since you've gotten this movie onto Amazon Prime, is there any interest by Amazon to maybe get the, your previous films on as well? I did have, uh, The Curse of Blood Mountain was on there. Um, and they kept it on for, I guess it was about a year, and then it got removed. It kind of just lost steam. It wasn't getting viewed, you know, and uh, anymore. It was doing pretty well for a while and then fizzled out. And, again, you know, I think we've improved so much for, with our production value. We have an upgraded camera, which makes a huge difference from in this project from the last, and I've learned so much. And, again, I had you know, a lot of help from, you know, my, my good friend Dave Watkins, who, who you know, light years ahead of me on production <laughs> side and, you know, my daughter and other friends and, and you know, the cast members actually, when they're not in a scene, you know, they'll hold the boom pole, they'll hold, <laughs> move the lights, like it's all a big mess. So the whole cast and crew, our good friend Joshua Hare, who we work with a lot, he, uh, he, he's, you know, he would hold, he would run camera, he would hold boom, he would hold the light and then he's in <laughs> half the scenes, you know, so we had a lot of people like that. Makes me think of the movie Bowfinger. Yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah I noticed, everybody's got a, a dozen jobs. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I just want to mention my friend uh, Paul Kakis. He he's in the, he's a, got a part in the movie. He's from Danbury, Connecticut, as well. He lives down in the Atlanta area now. But uh, he he's like a publicist for me. He shares the movie everywhere. And uh, and then our good friend John Morgan, who I've known for twenty thirty years, recently we reconnected, and then. That's how I, I got in touch with you guys, which has been amazing to kind of get this out there, you know, since we have no budget, you know, mm -hmm. we're just trying to follow our dreams and to be able to get this movie out to where people see it and talk to people is amazing. What do you think was the most difficult thing for you to learn when you got into film production? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, everything. It's kind of funny. <laughs> the, um, I talked to a friend of mine, that two, two friends of mine that made an independent movie, Lee, Lee Bivens and, and Greg Bivens, and they're in the Atlanta area. And I asked them, I was like, what, what did you learn, you know, about making your feature film? And what, what, you know, advice do you have for me? Greg said, make sure you have a Sharpie near the water bottles. Otherwise, you'll end up with 500 water bottles all over set. <laughs> and I was like, that's it? He's like, yeah, that's the best advice I can give you. So I did that. But uh, Critical information. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. But honestly, it's crazy because there's so much. It's hard to tell. Like, getting good audio is, almost, is an, so difficult. Lighting, you know, the camera work, it's also crucial. But probably what gives me the, 
the most fits is the audio. You know, you think you got everything, and then you get back, and your audio is like corrupted by. There was like a refrigerator running in the next room, <laughs> or you know what I mean? It's yeah. just like it's so it's crazy. So there's so many so many little things. Um, scheduling again when you have no or low budget, and you're trying to you know you want to keep continuity throughout the movie, and and then you try to get people back. We had to re- do several rewrites on Bigfoot: The Conspiracy just because people couldn't make it. People had to work, had to cut scenes out, you know. So we we got to a certain point, and after COVID and everything, I'm like, man, we just got to release it like it is because we're never going to get it finished. We're never going to get these people back together, and um, unless we, you know. So so we put it together and made a couple of scenes to kind of connect it all and 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 release it, you know. Well, it, 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 it's just fascinating to talk to someone like you who's kind of gotten into this and had to learn the ins and outs and all of these different things because you know. Like I mentioned, the movie Bowfinger and, and things like that, you know, they kind of show you a little bit of the behind the scenes of making movies. And then you think about that on a, on a, on a larger scale and on a big budget film, and you, and you don't, you know, you, you suddenly start to understand why it costs so much money to make these movies because of, there's so many moving parts. And as you said, just the audio, I mean, I, I, can, I, I feel you on that. You know, you think you got a good take, and then you go back and something, you know, an airplane went over or something like that ruined the whole sound. Uh, oh my God. It's just, you know, it's got to be just really uh, kind of frustrating and you have to really kind of keep, you know, your commitment up the whole time you're doing this or you could just lose your mind, right? Oh, for sure. And when I first, you know, kind of started dabbling a little and I was getting involved with some other independent projects, no, like several people didn't finish their movies. They would start to, all these people would commit so much time and effort and then they wouldn't finish, wouldn't finish. And I was like, so frustrating i'm like that's it i'm just doing my own stuff from now on i'm not even going to get involved in anyone else's because nobody finishes their project mm. and then when i started mine i you know halfway through i was like okay i get it now <laughs> i get why people don't finish but there was no way you know i would start one and not finish it because again people gave you everything they had and all their time and effort you can't just what am i going to do just stop tell, you know walk away from that i'm like that's my motivation is all the all the time and effort everybody else has put into the project is what drives me to finish through all the frustrating times, through all the computer crashes and editing software, <laughs> you know, crashes and, you know, oh my goodness. Half, you know, several of these scenes in this movie we had to what they call ADR, which is re-record, you know, um, the, the voices and the dialogue in the, in the studio, in a studio, which was my basement, you know, um, and then recreate the Foley, the background noise and everything else that sounds organic in the scene because the audio was so bad that we shot, you know. So. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I went to Connecticut School of Broadcasting, and one oh, of the projects okay. we had yeah. to do was we had to write a 30-minute uh, radio show on something. It had to have be one single theme. And, and I ended up writing the script myself because I, I thought I had what was a pretty good idea. And I had this image in my head, this, 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 I, I could hear how I wanted certain things to sound and, uh, you know, how I wanted the, the, the guy who was going to be the lead actor in this sound and, and, and what, what kind of a, uh, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, what, what kind of a uh, uh, atmosphere I was trying to create. And right. then we got to actually doing it and recording it. And I, I guess it was part of my failure because I just couldn't get what I heard in my head out of these other people I was working with. And it was so right. frustrating for me because I knew what I wanted and I tried to explain mm-hmm. it a hundred different ways and I just it could and I didn't want to go, I'll do it myself, you know, but, uh, did, I mean, did you experience any of that? Do you experience any of that when you're making films? Yeah, it's funny you say that. Um, for sure, like, when I write and, and, and vision what's happening, the first movie, Curse of Blood Mountain, because I just looked up how to produce a feature, I storyboarded the whole movie. So I did a lot of preparation before I started filming that. And since then, I haven't. I just can... I'm more, I'm more confident going in, so I know what I want and I know what I need to get. But, yeah, absolutely. Like, I'll look at a shot the way it's set up and this and that. I'm like, this is not, you know. And then, again, um, what you said, like, the score, for instance, this movie, um, Bigfoot the Conspiracy, uh, an awesome guy by the name of James Walker that I met um, by chance. He was working at the physical therapy office where I took my daughter, Raina, for she had knee surgery. And we got to talking, and he is an aspiring music composer and uh, found out I was making this movie, came to me, offered to do the score for screen credit because it was his dream. So I was like, 
yeah, go for it, you know. And, and I gave him a little bit of kind of direction on what I wanted, but I just let him at the helm. And um, what he created was different than what I had imagined completely for the most part. Mm -hmm. But it, but it's awesome, you know. And I just love that he really, you know, was really committed to the project and, and you know, was really into it and heartfelt with everything he did. Um, it's different than... You know, the score and everything, the whole thing from the end product is different than what I envisioned in the beginning. Um, but, it, you know, I'm happy with it. I mean, it, I'm never completely satisfied because every time I look, watch the movie, I'm like, oh, we should have done that better. I wish we had more time. <laughs> we ran out of time one day and we had to shoot a couple scenes quick, you know, and that's always the case. You're always under the gun for time because people have to go to work or this and that. and you, They're leaving town. And so there's so many things that you can't that, you know, that are up kind of out of your control that you just got to fight through but and just you know you got to just be willing to move on yeah like i see some people a lot of indie filmmakers will make a movie and then just put it through film festivals for years and then shelf it and wait to get distribution and i'm like you know you got to just as soon as you're done with it put it where it's going to be whether it's on youtube or prime or if you get a small time distribution or netflix i know some people have some stuff on netflix which is amazing um, and then immediately you have to go to your next project. You can't sit there, keep running it through festivals year after year. And it's like, let it go. Let it go. <laughs> you know, move on. Well, because maybe like, I, that's the only, cause you're never going to change the mistakes you made in that one. Right. And it, you know, you have to be realistic about what it is. You know, these are low budget movies, you know? Well, it's funny that you, you mentioned that because it was, uh, 2000 that I, I went to the CSB. And I started yeah. working here, my very first radio job, uh, in 2010. And I started doing this show, which was like my first time getting paid to do a radio show. Uh, nice. In, in two, yeah. in about, I'm just gonna, I'm just starting next week. I'll just be starting my fifth year. But oh, about a couple of years ago, I found the cassette tape of that production that we had done. And as you, as you say, you know, put it away, you're done with it, it's finished. No, I brought it in here to the radio station and I transferred it over to MP3 and I went through and edited out all the stuff that I remembered <laughs> just driving yeah. me nuts. And it's never yeah. going to play anywhere, it's never going to probably be broadcast anywhere, it's just that I had to do it. <laughs> sure. Yeah, no, I, I understand that completely. I understand that completely. I had to clean it up. Yeah. Um, now, you've received a couple of awards here um, uh, for a couple of your movies in the past, haven't you? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, which was um, very sh shocking and, and amazing. The Curse of Blood Mountain, I had put it in a film festival, the um, Southeastern International Film Festival in 2015, and we actually won Best Local Film in the festival, and that was in Delanica, Georgia, and that was just you know, shocking to me. And um, and then shortly thereafter, I want, um, well, it's about the same time, I guess, looking back, I wanted to have a premiere, like an official premiere night. So I went to the local theater in, um, in Canton, Georgia, a historic theater down there, and went to the manager about having a premiere with my movie. And uh, so he said, well, bring it in. We'll screen it and see. And um, we watched it. He absolutely loved the movie. And I was the first independent film ever, you know, screened at that historic Canton theater because they had just turned everybody else away because they didn't, they weren't. They didn't like the quality, they didn't like the content, whatever. And uh, so then the manager at the theater showed the movie to a bunch of city managers and brought them in and in the area, in North Georgia, in the uh, Atlanta area. And they all loved the movie and they named it the official film of Georgia Zombie Fest, <laughs> the huge street festival. So it kind of grew from there and became its own thing. And we used to play it at the Zombie Fest and we would sell out. And, People would literally be lined up to get my autograph and take their picture with me and everything. That was really mind blowing. But um, but it was a really cool experience, you know. And then the next one I did was called Halfway to Hell. I didn't write that one. Um, I just you know co-produced it and directed it and, and, sh and filmed it and edited it. And it was a web series we did, and then we turned it into a feature-length movie, and then submitted it to a bunch of festivals, and we got accepted into the um, an international film festival in Milan, Italy, um, and uh, I got nominated, you know, as best editor of a feature film, and actually won. Wow! Which was 
blew my mind. Yeah. yeah. The World World Independent Cinema Award. And uh, it was crazy because it's like 250 movies that get accepted into that into that festival. And it was mind blowing. So, and I also made a lot of great friends through there that I that I work with and I'm working on projects with right now from all over the world. So. That's I mean, it's just it's amazing, isn't it? When uh, is this something that you've always been interested in, or is this something that just like as you said, you had to find something to do with your life, and you said, well, this is kind of this could be fun, and you pursued it, no. and obviously you've been successful. No, I've always always it was probably my dream, you know, to do this from the beginning. I've always been enthralled by this kind of stuff. Um, when I was, I remember as a kid being at my cousin's and my uncle had a, a one of those old, big, bulky camcorders with the VHS tape in it. Yep. And we would use it and make like little shorts and, and music videos. And, and then I remember doing that with a camcorder I had years later and then kind of got away from all that. But I'd always, always, you know been intrigued by that and interested in that. I always loved going to the movies. I mean, it's so exciting. It's the opening credits and the, everything when you're, you know, in the movie theater. And I've, you know, we've kind of been drawn to it. So when it just struck me one day that, you know, when I was working after I got out of the government, I can't do this anymore. You know, I got to... <laughs> Well, that's I kind of the, passionate about something. Yeah, you know? no, I, I love those. I love these kinds of stories because that's kind of like where I was. I'd, I'd had all kinds of jobs, but ever since I was like in my teens, I wanted to get into radio, and it, mm-hmm. and I, you know, and tried a couple of times here and there, offered to work for free at places, and uh, and, and as, as I said, you know, I'm then now I'm starting my fifth year here as a paid talk show host, which is like wow. I never, first of all, expected to. It's amazing. It, it yeah. is. It's pretty incredible. And it's like, you know, to, to have that kind of a, a dream and know that, you know, well, but life takes you in all these different directions and you got to raise your kids and you have to pay the mortgage and you can't take a job that basically pays nothing. And, you know, so you can't, you know, it, it's so many roadblocks that get in the way, but then suddenly an opportunity pops up and you just got to say yes and you take it. You never know where it's going to take you. And it sounds like it's taking you in some really fantastic uh, directions. Yeah. You know, i I, you know, I'm making the most of it. You know, I still think about my old job. I'm still, it's hard, you know, when you go through things and especially, you know, in the border patrol, you know, again, you know, there's a lot of people down there that had a whole career of it. And I, I, I respect those people, you know, my brothers and sisters down there more than anyone in the world, you know, because of the job. And uh, when you experience that kind of stuff, when you have, you know, I was a trainee maybe two weeks in the field the first time I got shot at, and bullets were just whipping past my head. And I remember consciously thinking, man, I guess that's what it sounds like when a bullet goes by your head, you know? <laughs> and uh, I'm going to help you out when you make a movie where there's going to be gunfire. Yeah, for sure. And uh, so, um, but when you see death and, and experience all this kind of craziness, and you train the way we train, and then all of a sudden at a young age, that's just one day, it's like it's over. Mm it's hard to turn that off and, and function and you, you die of boredom in doing any regular job. You just die of boredom and you go crazy. So uh, I just had to do something, you know, to have a creative outlet and do something that I, you know, I could be passionate about, take my mind off of, you know, other things. So. Well, I want to I tell you, I, I've really enjoyed our conversation and I really want to give you, uh, uh, I hope you have find greater success than you have even so far. Uh, it's just pretty amazing I to me. You that, uh, you know, you, you found, you had something that you loved, you figured out a way to make it happen, and uh, you, you obviously are very successful at it, uh, you know, and who knows, maybe someday you'll be up there with the uh, the Scorseses and <laughs> making yeah, the yeah, big films. Nice, right? nice. But I would say, if I were you, the one thing that I would strive for is to get your movie done uh, by Mystery Science Theater 3000 type of thing. That, I think, would be the, the ultimate <laughs> yeah, huh? Yeah, maybe so. <laughs> That'd be cool. That would be, be cool. cool yeah, that would be amazing. So Chris Samoes, yeah. again, the movie is called Bigfoot, The Conspiracy. You can find it streaming on Amazon Prime. And also Halfway to Hell, I think, is still on YouTube, correct? Yep, and Bigfoot, The Curse of Blood Mountain is still on YouTube. It's still on YouTube as well. Well, uh, continued success, Chris. It's, um, it sounds like you thank found you. your uh, you found your passion and you've been able to make it work for you. And again, I just love stories like that. So I want to thank you so very much for joining me here today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. All right, so you have a great day. All right, you too. Take thank care. You. And we're going to take a break, and we'll be back to finish up today's Talk of the Town after these words.